It's more than an honor to introduce Fred Ho, and he will also be in the company of the wonderful Ben Barson this evening. And I had to write my notes, because when I talk about Fred, I tend to babble on and on and on and on. Tonight, you are in the presence of a living legacy, composer, scholar, author, provocateur, teacher, warrior, and badass baritone saxophonist, right. Fred Ho. I can tell you that he has produced at least 20 albums of ferocious music over two centuries with a sound and a force. That's right, he's a lot older than he looks. <laughs> I met him in the 20th century and we're still friends in the 21st. He has a sound and a force not like anyone else. He also heckles his friends when they're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you he's a Harvard Arts Medal recipient, a Guggenheim Fellow, an international presence who's inspired thousands of people throughout his life. That his music has honored other warriors like Asata Shakur, Muhammad Ali, as well as the unknown warriors who work the fields, mold the bricks, drive the iron spikes of railroad tracks, fill the assembly lines of that illusory thing called progress. Fred Ho has elevated the unsung women, men, and children on whose backs this country was built. Fred Ho resurrects the memory and active presence of those that capitalist warmongers and profiteers would prefer to erase. Fred Ho, who is affectionately and respectfully referred to as the Green Monster, activates his art and passion to illuminate what is false while giving credence and dignity to what is possible. The word impossible is not in Fred's vocabulary. Born in Palo Alto, California, and raised right here in Amherst, Fred Ho has become an international voice and presence of transgressive, subversive, life-giving defiance of oppression in any form. Fred doesn't just see who you are. He sees all the possibilities of who you can be. And he will hold you to your highest self. Many will run, but most will be changed and become the agents of audacious optimism even as the corporate state attempts to bribe them into submission or slit their throats. That tepid place called the middle doesn't exist for Fred Ho. He screeches to the limits of imagination and excellence in all that he does. He believes another world is possible and has created a better world, making all of us who dare enter into the molten core of his being better than he found us. He will let you in deep, but you better wear fireproof gear and come clean because he has no patience for mediocrity, bigotry, laziness, or willful ignorance of any kind. Enter his home and he will feed your mind, body, and soul, and all of it will be world-class gourmet. When Fred Ho was first diagnosed with cancer, he didn't shrivel or shrink. He expanded, creating a staggering new body of work, albums, books, and a theater of dance, music, and text that continue to rattle the bones of the dead back to life. He has never waited for Passover to set the Seder table and welcome the stranger. He has always set a place for Elijah. Fred Ho has never waited for Easter to raise the dead back to life. His legacy is not just his artistic work, but the lives he has changed, the friends he has won, the enemies he has defeated, and the love he continues to demonstrate for all who dare to receive it. It isn't always pretty, trust me. <laughs> but it's always real. I'll let the work and the man speak for himself. I am honored to call him my friend, my comrade, my brother, my collaborator, and so much more. The ferociously optimistic green monster, Fred Ho. Thank you, Magdalena Gomez. Thank you, Teatro Vida. Thank you, Jim Lesko, um, Daryl, uh, Kayla, and everybody with Amherst Community TV. I came to Amherst, Massachusetts in 1964. And uh, 
I was here for a couple of years and then took a hiatus when my father went back to where I was born, Palo Alto, um, to take a sabbatical and uh, do research at Stanford University. But then I came back here in 1967, 68, and I stayed here until 1975. So Amherst pretty much is my home, and uh, I feel like I've come full circle in many ways and very happy to be here with this intimate group of people, some I've known for a very, very long time. Um, last year I was supposed to be here, and it was a packed room, um, but I f felt very, very sick. Um, I've been fighting cancer for uh, almost six years now, and uh, last year I had reached the precipice. And uh, many people, including myself, didn't expect that I would uh, live uh, after tumor number four and the plummet that I faced beginning April 1st of 2011. But as you can see, I'm still here, still alive. <laughs> that cancer now is stage 4B metastatic. I have right now a tumor in my right lung in my left groin, and it's terminal. Uh, when I'll pass is uncertain, could be by the end of 2012, could be a year from now, could be maybe as long as four years from now. But as far as I'm concerned, um, I've been gifted with uh, about six extra years because when I was first diagnosed August 4th, 2006, I was staged at 3B because the, the tumor was the size of a golf ball, one out of 22 lymph nodes had tested positive, meaning that it was already in my circulatory system, and it had burst through uh, the perineum. Um, but given the limitations of our radiographic technology, uh, the medical establishment uh, did not find cancer growing elsewhere, but uh, as I found, as I look back now in hindsight, it was growing. Um, and. Uh, uh, indeed, it was probably metastatic. It was not probably. It was metastatic then, but uh, their diagnostic methods uh, couldn't detect it. So, for anyone with colorectal cancer uh, at stage four, 92 percent pe people die within two years. Within four years, 100 percent of the people die. So, I've been here six, almost six years now. So, um, I've been blessed with that extra time for whatever time left. I have this planet, on this planet to fulfill a mission, which I'll speak about uh, momentarily. But I'm primarily here to thank everybody for coming out and also to introduce Ben Barson. Ben Barson is an exciting, virtuosic baritone saxophonist who I met about three years ago when I was um, asked by professors uh, Amy Jordan and Lily Kim at Hampshire College to come there to speak and perform. And uh, Ben had noticed um, a poster about my coming there and uh, was in the audience and was very excited about what I had to present. And he contacted me in New York and requested that I take him on as a private student. I had never taken on um, private students before. In fact, I had avoided and um, in many ways uh, didn't want to uh, teach in an informal sitting, setting. I was pretty disgusted with academia. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty much unhirable, uh, and I, and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, uh, not had to have a job my entire life. Uh, I've been, been an artist, creative artist for my entire life and, uh, done well, um, and, uh, didn't need to have a teaching job, but I saw the enthusiasm in this young man particularly beyond just musical. Um, uh, he was interested in the fact that my revolutionary ideas in politics seemed to permeate and pervade everything I did, including the music. And he, gave, he also heard in my music and also in, in, the, in reading some of my writings that I understood the fundamental ontological and epistemological blackness of so-called jazz. And I throw out those big terms only because he may speak on this more eloquently than I. But by 2011, after studying a year with me, I um, employed him in my professional work. Uh, first, kind of subbing for me as I became very, very ill 
uh, in April of 2011, and then pretty much taking on the baritone saxophone chair in my two principal ensembles, the Afro-Asian Music Ensemble and uh, the Green Monster Big Band. So I, I, find, I feel that Ben um, is a voice of the future on not only his instrument, but in terms of his consciousness and understanding that this music that's been uh, mitigated in the term jazz uh, is a revolutionary music and that that music itself offers a vision to attain uh, way beyond the limits of our uh, present consciousness and physical existence. So please welcome Ben Barson on baritone saxophone. You know, I'd like to you know, just mention briefly what a true blessing it has been to work with uh, Mr. Ho, he's such an amazing saxophonist. He truly walks the talk and talks the walk in a way that I didn't know was possible. I grew up in a suburban northern New Jersey town. It's predominantly white, upper middle class, very alienated. Uh, it was kind of like in the movie Bring It On, jock dominated. Jocks ran the school and walked around like they were gods. And they were treated like gods, so much so that in 1989, uh, when the football team raped a retarded girl by the name of Leslie Farber, the school administration said, oh, don't prosecute them, those are our guys. Make no mistake, these guys are the same guys that burned the indigenous civilizations to the ground, that permeated genocide in Europe, all over Africa and Asia. And I firmly believe that the imperial masculinity there has its roots hundreds of years in the past. But they will be judged. This is called Ballad for Leslie. As Fred briefly mentioned, um, I feel that jazz and African American and music in general have had a revolutionary effect on global culture and American history in particular. Um, and part of the reason is because of the importance they played in giving um, African Americans, in my mind, a, a coherent sense of identity through the massive migrations and displacements and diasporas they face in this country. Uh, Ralph Ellison put it really eloquently when talking about the great migration of slaves from the semi-feudal South to the most capitalist uh, and the most, at that time, socially complex environment that hetero existed in 
human history, the cities. Um, he said, in those days, it was either dying in noise or living with music, and we chose rapidly for the latter. Well, I was thinking about the Stono Rebellion in 1739, when 20 escaped slaves turned into a hundred through the use of the drum on top of a hill and stormed Charlottetown. I thought that's what living with music meant as well. <laughs> Pop classic rock, you know, what we call classic rock, and I feel like there's a classic rock station in every single city in the U.S., and it's Golden Oldies or, you know, Q1043, and, you know, I forget what the one around here is, you know, but, um, you know, they always play Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and maybe CSNY and some other stuff, but, you know, few people realize that um, the, the, the rock movement of the 60s was um, the white revolutionary consciousness that had spread from the third world into uh, the alienated middle and working whites in the U.S. at that time. Uh, David Crosby, uh, Wave Your Freak Flag High, and uh, MC5, Revolution in Our Lifetime. Uh, this is a tribute to that era of music. It's called M16. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Augustine Sandino, the great Nicaraguan revolutionary who almost single-handedly, along with his guerrilla army, drove the United States Marines out of occupying his country in the first part of the 20th century. He was a deeply spiritual person. He believed that revolutionaries, when they died, were reincarnated and continued the struggle despite their weak numbers and global history. And uh, he had a beautiful quote about the 20th century that the only thing that would be submerged forever was injustice and love's favorite daughter, divine justice, divine justice would reign forever. This song is a tribute to him and it's called Love's Daughter. I'm just going to conclude with a tribute to one of my favorite saxophonists, Charlie Parker, who uh, single-handedly uh, revolutionized both Western and non-Western music forever, took the most advanced European concepts and threw rhythm right back in their face. And despite his legacy and how he's trying to be canonized and how he's remembered, he was a musical and cultural revolutionary. This is called the Red Blues for Charlie Parker. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Thank you so much for your time. Please welcome Fred Ho to the stage. Thank you, Ben. First piece I dedicate to my friend, Wes Brown. Thank you for coming, Wes. It's based on a traditional Chinese folk song titled Sung Lang. But I expanded this folk song as part of a commission from the American Composers Orchestra and developed it into a concerto for baritone saxophone and symphony orchestra that had its world premiere at Carnegie Hall in 2008. It's entitled When the Real Dragons Fly. It has four epigrams that precede its performance. One, I was schooled on records and radio. My teachers were common sense and imagination. Jimi Hendrix, the lesson, self-learning is always the best. Number two, when the prison doors open, the real dragons will fly. Ho Chi Minh, the last shall be first, the first last. Third, Everything possible has been tried and nothing has changed. What we need is the impossible. Sun Ra. The lesson. Revolution is extremism. And lastly, fourth. Using the rat race as a justification is no justification. Fred Ho. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
The next piece is, is for the women in Teatro Vida. It, it's entitled La Chica Anti-Materialista. <laughs> the Anti-Material Girl. <laughs> The Civil Rights Movement asserted that the proper response to unjust laws is to break them. The Black Power, Black Liberation Movement that asserted that black freedom could only be found with the liberation of land in the United States of America. And with that liberation of land, it's it is imperative that humans subordinate and submit to Mother Earth. In that way, a true revolution that is ecocentric, indigenous centric, and matriarchal will happen. Uh-huh. 
our concluding musical portion of this evening. It's going to be a duet between Ben Barson and myself on a Duke Ellington classic, In a Sentimental Mood.
Thank you.